everybody. Hi, check it out. It's after the war. It's another RPG first look. We are here to take a look at Genesis of Legends after the war, which I got to say, like. The the subtitle of this game is so curiosity inducing in me, like this is the cover of the this is the cover of the book, right? And. The art is really nice. Uh, it's got this cool kind of post-apocalypse sense of scale that I like. It's it's nicely done, all of that. And that would have gotten me to take a look at it. But really, the thing that cemented whether I was going to look at this game or not, because uh, Jason reached out to me and was like, hey, do you want to do, do a first look at this this game? And because I couldn't like dig into it, I uh, I just had a look at the uh, at the drive through page, right? And at the uh, the website. And I was like, OK, after the war, post apocalypse, science fiction -y stuff, cool art. And then I was like, mimetic horror. Interesting. So I'm I'm curious to see how the concept of the game ends up matching up with the uh, with the mechanics of the game. I'm curious to see what a science fiction role playing game of mimetic horror looks like. So I guess that's what we're going to find out. We're going to take a look at After the War today. Uh, this uh, this first look has been uh, sponsored by Genesis of Legend. So thank you, Jason, for uh, for reaching out and giving me the uh, giving me the opportunity to take a look at the game. Um, the uh, I guess and, and I'm going to keep doing these, even though this is probably not your first time watching a, uh, a first look. The way the first looks uh, work is that we pick a role playing game. And uh, I literally take my first look at it. So right now, the only thing I know about this game is what we're seeing right here. And maybe a little bit of the marketing from the website that I picked up uh, by osmosis just by being on the page. So I'm going to go through and we're going to basically browse through the book. We're going to be looking at things like layout and art. We're going to be looking at what the game is about. We're going to look at its mechanics. We're going to take a, a glimpse at some of the tools the game offers to run it. But it's all brand new to me. So this isn't a um, this isn't a game review. Uh, this isn't it's not formal in any way. I'm going to be flipping through it pretty casually. And I, I sort of want to keep these. Like if I were in a game store and I, I just picked this book up off the shelf and I, uh, I flip through it. So you might already be familiar with After the War. You might already know kind of what it's about. Um, Keep in mind that I don't yet, uh, and part of this is going to be discovering that. We're trying to learn kind of what the game is about and whether it would be something that uh, I or you would uh, would want to check out and play. So let's let's dig in. Let's let's figure out what it is that after the war is about. So let's see here. So there's some some legal stuff. Um, we have our creators and contributors. I recognize a few names uh, on this list, uh, as I imagine you might as well. Uh, Avery Alder in the, the consulting list here. Uh, Claudia uh, Kangini, who is a fantastic, fantastic artist. Um, uh, Claudia has done a lot of work for um, uh, the indie RPG scene in Italy. Uh, a lot of Italian games uh, have uh, have her art in them, which is cool. Um, uh, Kira McGran, right? We know we recognize that name, Sarah Richardson. I think a lot of these guest writers are uh, Kickstarter setting block uh, creators. Yeah. So, all right. Here is here is our here is our first here is our first glimpse into the world uh, and what the game is what the game is about. So, all of you came to Polvo looking for a new beginning. You came from somewhere else, the decadence of old Terra the discipline of Mars, the freedom of the belt, or an alien world. You survived the terrible galactic war which marked your body and soul, a war against an infectious idea, a mimetic virus known as the Song. Th that seems cool. Uh, we had a war against an idea. You came to Polvo looking for a refuge, a hope, and an opportunity. You thought you were joining a community of strangers and built a home. Terrible things lurk in the wreckage of the war and the shadows of your minds. It's up to you to keep your people safe after the war. Now, it's interesting that it's this it's this big, like ominous kind of statement about what the game is about. And then down here, it's an example of one of those communities, I guess, that you're you're meant to keep safe. Right. It's a group of what I have to assume are kids uh, playing playing football and right? playing soccer. So 
Interesting pairing of the art there. All right, so uh, post-war, maybe also post-apocalyptic, your your refugees, right, from a, a war that I guess is over, right? We survived the war; it's over, but it has uh, it has marked us in some way, and we know that the enemy uh, ostensibly is a mimetic virus known as the Song. Now the war is over. It doesn't say we won the war, right? We just survived, so that'll be interesting to uh, to dig into. So this is our this is our table of contents, right? We've got uh, the game is broken down into the introduction, uh, survivor stories, right? So we got you know sixty pages or so of uh, intro stuff. We got some fiction, and then we dig into chapter three where we create characters. We create a settlement. There are the core rules of the game, stuff that fuels play, game mastering chapter, uh, setting timeline, some more setting stuff. It's interesting how it's broken up, right? So it's not like um, here are uh, here are some mechanical things and then here's all the setting. It seems like the chapters kind of vary, right? Where it's like game mastering is a predominantly mechanical chapter. Then we have a couple of setting chapters uh, and then we come into an example of play, which is more of a like learning the game chapter. And I, I do like I do like that it says down here kind of how to absorb the book, right? The best way to explore is to uh is to read from front to back but skip around if you need to um so yeah let's let's see what let's see what the deal is here um so we start the game with an introduction to the settings kind of core principles right um humanity has always heard the siren call of the unknown uh we reach for the stars first contact went well and we joined the larger universe okay so this is a sci-fi that has alien species that are uh, already established. So this is a um, humans reached out into the universe and we found other species. They took us in. Uh, we had an alien species called the Permancer that uh, that taught us uh, how to exist within the uh, within the world. Our utopian dream of peaceful exploration was born. So this is the Star Trek part of the game. And then we heard the song, a sentient melody encoded into atoms, a dark matter drumbeat of intelligence and hunger. The mimetic virus stole our free will, enslaving our minds to spread itself. The song raised every species' basis instincts to a crescendo, and humanity bowed in zealous servitude. Wow, that sucks. Okay, so I like I like that it is it is post apocalyptic in the sense that we lost we lost that war, right? Or we lost our struggle with the song. Humanity became its servants. The unified multi-species fleet became a battlefield as the crews aboard every ship and world were controlled by the song. Entire nations of humanity rose as one to assimilate the rest in the universe into the alien hive mind. That's uh, that's a high concept setting, but it's pretty cool. Um, I'm curious to see, again, I'm curious to see what the mechanisms look like for this, right? And yeah, it's it's nice to start with a strong antagonist. I find that that's something that games often have a hard time with or stumble with, so it's it's cool that they're like, the song. I wonder if the song is still going to be the the bad guy, right? The antagonist in the game. Um, or if it's going to be a sort of coming to terms with your own crimes thing, where it's like, we bowed to the song. I mean, I guess let's just read and find out. So each ship became part of the great choir, a colossal mobile transmitter array designed to boost the strength of the song. Worlds sang, worlds burned, ships, worlds, and societies shattered. Those who survived were given the choice to kill those they loved or let the universe join the hive mind. Damn. Black Sky Industries developed a distributed intelligence based on Illuvian technology as a mimetic counter virus to nullify the song. The Tormenta virus worked too well. Transfer oh, God damn. God damn, Black Sky. So to fight the virus, we came up with another one called Tormenta, uh, transforming a third of its victims into violent and ravenous monsters. The Great Choir chased the refugee flotilla from the ruins of Earth to the distant world of Polvo. That is where Tormenta was unleashed and transmitted to each ship. One by one, the great choir vessels fell. Tormenta spread to every ship uh, and world the fleet had visited. The sentient virus killed itself, burning through its hosts in the evening of its only day of life. Good. Okay, so we committed genocide on ourselves to get rid of uh, the terrible virus, and it ended with the quiet, numb sobbing of the last human standing. That sounds great. It's terrifying and and bad, but like I like games that start you down at the bottom. So a decade later, right? This is how much longer we have. So a decade later, the fleet fleet has dwindled from a multi system nation state to a handle of outposts serviced by less than two hundred vessels. It's a kind of um like a fall of the federation kind of narrative, right? So 
Uh, monitored by Permance or Peacekeepers, the struggling colonies are watched with zeal. Mandatory testing for symptoms of the song. All of settled spaces still crouched, ready, hands and their weapons. On Polvo, so Polvo is the, I guess it's like the gats of this setting. The graveyard of the past, the garden of the future, life went on. The planet was affectionately nicknamed Dirt, and like the survivors that found their way around, the name stuck around. It used to be a lot of things, a human fort, a staging post, corporate science preserve, and the front line. Now it's a junk world. Cool, good. Uh, millions have fled to try to build homes on dirt foundations. None of them came to dirt by choice, but everyone's ended up in the home of the biggest second chance in the universe. Yeah, right? Populated by the Junkions? Polvo is the only world in the universe where I feel I can dare to be stupid. <laughs> uh, okay, alright. So, um... Yeah, nickname, but Polvo literally means dirt in Spanish. Yeah, I mean, it's become its official name. Uh, let's see. New settlements are spread across the surface of this alien world. The song gathers its strength in the wilderness between supplement settlements, and the covenant lies empty. Yeah. All right, cool. So, only you can protect your new home. If you're lucky, you'll carve out a new life for yourself in this alien world. Welcome to dirt. Everyone starts somewhere. Your new life starts here. Okay, all right, so the setting of this game is that you have come, you and your the other players have come to Polvo from somewhere else. The universe has just gone through a war of attrition with an alien thought virus, uh, and we won by creating uh, an alternate thought virus of our own to uh, cancel it, but it was bad for us as well, right? We had to Adrian Vite ourselves. So... After the war is a science fiction. Okay, so now we're no longer speaking. The The voice of the game is shifted. It's no longer telling us about the, um, the, the background of the universe, but it's telling us as players, like, okay, now that you've gotten to page 10, the designer is going to tell us what the game is about. So science fiction, horror role-playing game set on the frontier world of Polvo in the aftermath of a galactic conflict. A game about diverse communities of Terrans, Martians, Belters, and aliens who come together to rebuild their lives on a rough frontier world. When the seductive song or brutal tormenta threaten your settlement, it's your job to protect your people. Your story is centered on the settlement you now call home, which you work to strengthen and grow. As leaders in the community, you deal with internal disagreements and external threats because this is the only place you have left. So it's kind of given me like an apocalypse world meets stars without number vibe, right? Where, yeah, where we like, it's about community, which apocalypse world is deeply, and then it's also about this kind of larger universe with with stuff going on. We happen to be focused on a, on a particular world. So to play the game, it's four to six players. It has a game master. So it's got that um, it's got that uh, that sort of approach. Right. It's a, a traditionally structured role playing game. Uh, each player has character sheets. The group shares a settlement sheet and the game master has a plot map to track dramatic threats. Uh, we'll need the group will need at least 24 dice. So ideally, each person would have a dozen. Okay, I've got I got a dozen d sixes kicking around. I think most people, as a group, will be able to come up with that many six sided dice. Uh, you'd normally be using pencils, but you should have at least one pen at the table as well. I kind of like this as a as a tease page because I don't know why, and it's making me wonder. Like, why would I need a pen? Why would I? Why why would I need a pen in a role playing game? Why specially, right? Uh, beyond that, it is uh, useful to have blank index cards to take notes and make name tints. Uh, you'll find it useful to write audience mode on one side and your character name on the other. Audience mode? That's cool. Right? Actor mode, audience mode, and then you have your character name and you flip it back and forth. Uh, okay, so we're going to need a bunch of dice. We're going to need a pen. We're going to need some pencils. And we're going to need uh, a uh, some blank index cards. Okay, all right. So, and after the war, most people who play the game are players, who are the characters that build the the, the settlement and try to keep it safe. Um, most of you will create a player character. Each of you will create a PC. Each player character is a survivor, a protector, a believer, and a dreamer. Keep these roles at the forefront of your mind as you play your character. Now, I wonder if these... I wonder if these are mechanical roles or if they are uh, just frameworks for character concept, right? I guess we'll learn, but it, it's something that is true of everybody, right? It says each player is all these things, right? Survivor, protector, believer, and a dreamer. So I'm guessing it's more like principles for the, the player characters, but we'll, we'll figure that out. Um, 
to the game master. One person at the table, the game master who administers and facilitates the game. Uh, they control the setting. They speak for the NPCs. They describe the frontier world. I'm basically just looking for anything that is different from what we'd normally expect from a PC GM structure, right? So it seems to me this is a pretty standard uh, GMing role, right? And then uh, Fallout is, oh, so the GM hero, this is the bit that's interesting. So the GM portrays the Fallout, Song, Tormenta, and Community. These are the four kind of main things that you play as the GM. It's a bit like your agendas, principles, and moves in the sense that this is what you're thinking about, right? So you're going to portray Fallout, right? Show the fallout of the war. You're going to portray the song, right? Which is the dangerous alien thought virus that warps people's minds. It's got kind of like a, uh, it's interesting because it's, it's two different zombie movies at once. I find it really interesting that it's not just like everyone versus the song. It's everyone versus the song, but also tor the Tormenta because Tormenta, if you look, the song is the insidious virus that fucks with your brain and you're like wondering if somebody is possessed by the song or not. And then Tormenta is they they're clearly affected by it because Tormenta makes you um, it turns off the, the smart part of your brain and focuses you on your instincts. Right. So I'm curious to see if there is a way for us to track the influence of those things on a on a character uh, and then community. Right. So those are our four things we think about as the as the game master. Right. To portray. So, um, after the war is about the aftermath of a galactic war and the people who survived those events, the game is here to give you tools to tell those stories productively and safely. The game can often go dark and vulnerable places as the song and Tormenta offer emotional and physical violence to their victims, right? And that, that stuff can be triggering. It's a horror game. The, the game knows about its themes. It introduces uh, the X card as an option for uh, for playing safely. It also uh, invites uh, going dark, which I think is a kind of lines and veils conversation, right? At any point in time during play, anyone can say the phrase, then things go dark, we fade to black, and yeah, here we go, similar to another safety tool known as a veil. I kinda like that, that it introduces a an in-game uh, like narrative um, opportunity for a player to just say the phrase, right? I like that it's a ritualized phrase, right? Then things go dark, right? Because it, it allows you, there's a script. It, exactly, it allows you to say like, we we are allowed to do this. Everyone has that right, and that way you don't feel like you're stepping on anybody's toes, right? Because this is a rule. Anyone can do it anytime. Yeah. That's cool. Um, humanity has a long history of prejudice, discrimination, and hatred, which has persisted despite the union's moderating influence. Uh, we don't want to harm the players at the table, so expressing these require a bit of finesse. Uh, I like this. I like that it's in a rule. It's it's a rule in the game. Just never use real world slurs. Like just don't don't do that, right? That's that's good. We're not here to like. I I'm I'm a fan of this, and I think that a lot of the time this is why we find these things uh, in the. Um, in the universe where we, you know, like with the uh, Battlestar Galactica, they didn't want to say fuck. So they, they, they say frack instead. It, that's sort of like this too, but it's nice that it's nice that they're specifically targeting a rule to say, don't use real world slurs that could actually hurt people come up with something else or, and I like this even more, right? I like this even more. You're only defending them because you're a, and then he says a slur for belters, right? I think that's cool. I think being able to say that where I could say like, um, he draws his sword and he says, stop looking at me like that. And then he calls you something that's like a really offensive word for orc. I like that. I, I feel like that's something I want to, I want to include. Cause I think a lot of the time we get into this thing where we come up, we feel clever. We come up with these like, oh, well it's not, you know, it's not like, it's not actually an insult. It's, it's just the elvish word for gay people. So eventually if your homophobic elvish slur is like, I don't know, elves call you a, a thrawn, right? You, you, you fill that word with the same hatred and the same thing. And eventually it's just like, it becomes uncomfortable to hear anyway. So I kind of like this idea of like, just, we don't need a word for it. We don't need to give that thing power, but this person is, is do, saying something racist or homophobic or whatever, and they, they use a slur. We don't need to imagine one because there's no point, right? I think that's, that's clever. Yeah, right? We're, exactly. Words gain the meaning we give them 
And so you might not actually be saying a real world thing. It's yeah, you you're just making up a new euphemism that still carries the same weight. So this is a nice way to kind of deflect that. Because really, when somebody uses a uh, a racial slur or a homophobic slur or whatever, when someone uses it, what you're trying to do as a as a portrayer of an NPC is you're trying to tell your your players something about that character, right? The fact that they would use that word, right? Like the the police chief in Blade Runner, when Deckard comes in and sees him for the first time, he describes Roy Batty and company as skin jobs. Right. And the reason that we do that isn't necessarily just to let us know that we had there is a racist slang for synthetic humans. It's to show something about that character to the point where in the voiceover version of Blade Runner, Deckard specifically calls that out, though he does so by using another racial slur, which is part of why I'm glad they cut that from the movie. But anyway, this is an interesting, uh, interesting thing. I like it. I think it's a good piece of advice. Uh, we get the World of Darkness style uh, setting terminology, the lexicon. I always, always skip these on purpose. I intentionally and meaningfully skip these because I don't want to be told what meanings, uh, what words mean. I want to learn them in the in the context. Uh, that's just a personal approach. I I don't I don't want to read even two pages of like. This is what a neonate is. I like the idea of do, of of figuring that out uh, through context, and I should I should theoretically be able to, right? And then I can refer back to it if I uh, if I don't. So, okay, rules terminology though. Uh, characters have uh, beliefs. You believe in these a declaration that your main your character holds. Uh, you look at the beliefs uh, as a player uh, critically, seeking out evidence to confirm or refute your beliefs. You gain insight when you confront your beliefs which allows you to share discovery and growth. Okay. Um, convictions are created when you choose to fully accept or reject a belief during a moment of growth. Convictions are similar to beliefs, except you're no longer willing to examine them critically. Interesting. Okay, so you believe something, you test your beliefs, and once they've proven out, they become convictions? All right. Interesting. I kind of like that. And then insights. You receive insights when you're faced with evidence that supports or rejects your beliefs. You have an insight track and reaching certain milestones triggers moments of discovery or growth. Right. And I imagine this is more about like personal stuff and less like a Bloodborne style becoming aware of the universe in a supernatural sense. But yeah, okay. So you believe things. You gain insight when you support or reject your belief. And then uh, you can form convictions uh, after your beliefs have been uh, proven out for your character. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, the game is built uh, out of scenes. A scene begins with a platform driven into action by a tilt and ends when its question is answered. Okay, so it's got kind of a story game vibe, though that term is sort of useless. But it's uh, it's framed in scenes. Um, and uh, when two people in a scene disagree on what should happen, it triggers a conflict. Uh, and then you have traits that represent experiences, skills, or identities. Interesting. Okay. So this is a game about, right? We're learning. Yes. It's a game about like the song and the tormenta or whatever, but mechanically so far we've learned this is a game about characters that believe things, but not so much that their beliefs cannot be uh, tested, refuted, and altered, right? Characters that desire insight, characters that discover things about the world and grow and scenes contain conflict in which we invoke our uh, our traits. Okay, cool. Uh, strain represents stress, harm, and trauma. So, like, whenever bad things happen to you, you can uh, you can receive strain. You receive strain when you choose to reroll during a conflict or when you win a conflict. You receive strain when you win a conflict. Each point of strain makes it harder to succeed and can lead to your character's retirement. Hmm. Okay, I mean, we're going to have to see what that looks like in the conflict rules. Uh, small interlude which takes place between scenes, typically only involving one or two PCs, is a moment. It can be a moment of growth, discovery, corruption, or grief. These are um, downtime scenes, I guess. Yeah, hmm, okay. Again, like with the, like with the page about what we're going to need, this is really all a teaser. I'm curious about this stuff, but yeah. 
Uh, and then our inspirations. So anybody who said that the people that wrote this are fans of The Expanse, there it is. It's number one on the list. Uh, we've also got uh, the Belle Dame Apocrypha, which I've never heard of, um, but it's a set of three books about bounty hunter, about a bounty hunter, uh, Star Trek, which I've heard of, Firefly, also maybe you've heard of it, Mass Effect, uh, Spark, which is another of Jason's role playing game, uh, Apocalypse World, right, which we've kind of seen, uh, Dream Apart, Dream Askew, those are both uh, games about community, right, community and marginalization. Uh, how we came to live here, dread. That's good. So it's nice seeing a, a mix of uh, fiction and uh, other role playing games and video games. I think this is a good this is a good inspiration. It gives me some ideas about what the um, what the game might feel like. Makes sense. This all this all tracks for me. Uh, cool. All right. So I think I'm gonna skip through this section because it's mostly fiction, right? Uh, but I will say, uh, so this is, I believe this is a Claudia Kangini piece. Check it out. You ever wanted to be a horse that writes in cuneiform? Now, now you can. Now you can. Cuneiform horse. That's what that is, right? That's cuneiform. The little, little stylus with the cone shapes. Yeah. That's true. The horse has horns too. There's two of them. So he's not really a unicorn. He's like a tiefling horse. A duo corn. Anyway, so we're going to skip this section because it's it's just interviews with it's it's all in fiction stuff. And I always skip that if I'm flipping through a book anyway. Um, it does look like there. This is kind of neat where it's like, OK, so this is uh, this is a, a, a fictional interview with this character. And then at the end, this, I assume, will make more sense later. Right. Alliances are better than subjugation. Self-governance is a human right. Terran, political community, silence, rendered aid, leader, organizer. I have no idea what this means, but I'm guessing these are either beliefs or convictions. And I think this is what an NPC stat block looks like in this game. That's my guess. So there's our interview with Phoebe, with Nat, with Namid, with Imani, with Krisha, Palmer, Sophie. That's a lot. Dr. Max, Corteza. Integrity So, Danica, Otso, Eden. Interesting. So, you know, I, I'm not a I'm not like a big fan of like chunks of story stuff or or setting, but this is an interesting way of of uh imparting it, right? It's not a uh it's not a fictional um it's not Elminster telling us about Shadowdale. It's interviews with a whole bunch of different people, which creates tonally uh, a sense of diversity, right? Because uh, each of these interviews is, is written from the voice of a different character. So we get uh, some access to uh, to that. And then also it shows that there are a bunch of different kinds of people um, involved in this game, right? So it's it's an interesting way to, to develop setting, um, but not something that I generally spend a ton of time on uh, when I'm uh, when I'm looking. Uh, at a uh, at a book first thing I do also like and and this is kind of cool and I wouldn't have noticed this if I hadn't hovered uh, the PDF of the game now you probably can't see this because the text is so small but uh, it has um, uh, support for um, viewers uh, that that provide um, I know I forget what the technical alt text thank you Zev that's what's called alt text for uh, uh, readers that, that describe the images. So it'll say, 03, character creation, an image of an elegant, dark-skinned Terran woman wearing a hijab with a city in the background. 03.01, new beginnings. So that's quite cool. I don't know that I've ever, I don't know if I've ever seen a PDF that does that. So you just hover in it. Yeah, that's very cool. Neat. All right, so character creation. Let's see how we make characters in this game. So let's see, um, you have six, uh, each character creates a primary character they will portray during the game. You have six traits, two beliefs, and a name. Your first trait is your origin. Each origin has five options. Choose which one you pick as your second trait. Uh, I see, okay, so you're Terran, then that has five. Martian has five. Belter and Alien both have five each, okay. And then your third trait is your war story. Uh, the key event in the War of the Song that shaped you, you might remember the overture, Crescendo, dissonance, or silence. Each war story has five options. You pick those as your fourth trait. Okay, so it's going to be Terran something, 
crescendo something. And then your fifth trait is your profession. Right. And so we're looking at these are these are characters, right? So it's alien, Fundar, the Riven, Crescendo, Scorched Earth, Veteran, Officer, and then name and the two beliefs. Okay. All right. So that's where we start with our characters as well. Okay. All right. So your fifth is your profession. You might be a builder, veteran, leader, or scholar. They have five options, and you pick one of them as your sixth trait. Your two beliefs are subjective and controversial opinions. You struggle to confirm or reject. So whoever said that this game was like a sci-fi post-apocalyptic version of Twitter? Um, this, this, yes, I suppose. <laughs> this confirms. I have a subjective and controversial, this is your spicy take. Each character is Utrist. Yeah, so you're right. Each character has two hot takes that they need to struggle with. Uh, and then you have a name and a title that describes you. Um, when you roleplay in a scene, your traits give you context for decisions. When you enter into conflict, your traits give you bonus dice if they apply. Each trait comes with a short description in a few different ways they could be giving you bonus dice in roles. Player characters can share origins, war stories, or professions, but no two characters can share the same share the specific trait option. Right, okay. So, we are either a Terran, a Martian, a Belter, or an Alien, which all I think are fairly straightforward. Um, and then, where you came from. Okay, so your first trait will be one of the four origin categories. Your second trait will be one of that origin's options. Right, which was, um, let's see, so you Terran... Right. Yeah. Okay. I see how it's it's broken down into like situation and option. Okay. So Taryn, you are from a got it. Okay. So if you're from Earth, you are from a political community, a faithful community, an academic community, agricultural, or a citizen community. Um, and then from there, you get your second trait as one of the options. Yeah. Okay. All right. Taryn political. Terran academic, Martian armada, Martian cornerstone, right? So again, these are setting, right? This is character creation as setting, which is quite cool. I'm not sure. I guess these are, I'm not totally sure how to read this page because it doesn't tell me what situations are, but I'm, I'm guessing these are situations within these communities and maybe not really something that is going on your character sheet. Okay, all right. So you're a Martian, you are from a Cornerstone Division, Armada Division, Titan, Minerva, or Sculptor Division, and then these are situations within those those divisions. You can be a Belter, and if you're a Belter, you are a member of the Stewards, the Marshals, the Transporters, the Wanderers, or the Resistance. <laughs> the Resistance is called Bradbury Weeps. And that's funny. <laughs> Uh, okay, and then these are situations within, and I, I wonder, I think this might just be stuff your character might care about, and that might be important to your sort of little sub-faction, or you're an alien, uh, and if you're an alien, you might be a member of the Permancer, oh, that was a Permancer, humanities, like, teachers and caretakers, that horse, the two, the two-horned horse, that's a Permancer, uh, the Alluvia, a semi-tangible post-organic species that looks like a cloud of mirrors rotating around a central point of light. Hell yes. Talking horses. Alien mirror clouds. Fuck yeah. I like it. Uh, the Mercurio, shapeshifters driven to seek new forms. The Ursa, hypersocial bear-like species that always work in packs of four. Uh, or the Fundar, the avian Fundar shared their world with their, their Resgato cousins till they were divided by a terrible weapon. So this is a Fundar, this lady right here. <laughs> the two types of TNG alien. <laughs> I mean, we don't have the bumpy forehead one. So it is, yeah, it is a bit, let me see. So it is a bit interesting that we have... It, it's got a bit of that D&D &D problem where it's like um, a bunch of different kinds of human and then each alien species is like a mono, a monoculture, right? In the sense that it's like Terrans, people from Earth can be 
you know, these five things and humans from Mars can be these five things and humans from the belt can be these five things. But if you're in Alluvia, you're in Alluvia. That's it. It's just this one, this one thing. And I, I don't know, I guess we'll have to see. Maybe they're rare enough that if you're like, you're the only one or, or there aren't that many aliens. I guess we'll see. Let's, let's keep going. Uh, so your next, your next pair is war story. So it's what part of the war and what do you remember from it? Uh, so something left a lasting mark on your body, mind, and soul. So either you're involved mostly in the beginning of the war, the darkest period in the middle, uh, the bloody resistance at the end, and then the silence kind of after the war, right? Like recovering from the war. So your third trait will be which one, right? Which one of those? And then your fourth trait will be one of those, one of their options. So if you were part of the overture, maybe you were on Feynman Station. Maybe you were part of uh, First Contact, The Prelude, Shelter in Place, or Bastion's Children. And then these are your kind of like tones, I guess, and themes. The crescendo, right? This is when things were, were getting all, all intense, right? Personal Apocalypse, Ortline, Starlift, Fire Sale. So again, this stuff is all setting material that is tied to character creation, right? And it lets us know, and it's presented in, in order, so we kind of know how the war went, right? So this is stolen plans, recruitment drive. This is teaching us the story of the war through character creation. Because essentially, the players are going to go through these options. And then lastly, it's your profession. So you are a builder, a veteran, a leader, or a scholar. So if you're a builder, you are a wreck runner, an engineer, a trader, an agent, or a salvager. Yeah, I think the thing I like most about this is the way that it is imparting setting. That character creation, it's like uh, life paths in um, in Burning Wheel, right? Uh, you could be a veteran. If you're a veteran, you are a pilot, a medic, a grunt, a sentinel, or an officer, a leader, an organizer, an imam, a Prospero, I guess it's a Prospero, you're a weirdo who maybe lives outside of town, you're a space wizard. Oh, you're literally a space wizard. Okay, you're a Prospero in a very literal sense, good. You have unnatural gifts that cannot be explained by science. Well, good, okay. So again, imparting setting, we didn't know until right now that mystic arts were a thing. Uh, and then you could be a storyteller or a diplomat. Yeah, all right, and then this is, this is the, yeah, the layout of each one, right? So scholar, xenobiologist, sociologist, physicist, psychologist, or lawyer. So you could, I guess, in theory, as you go through character creation, you could be an alien, a member of the Alluvia, who was most affected by the war during the crescendo. Uh, you were, uh, during the scorched earth part of the crescendo, right? You were one of the rare survivors of the assault. And uh, your job now as a cloud of memory crystals, uh, you could be a, a scholar. So now I study the law. Oh my God, I'm a big shiny space lawyer. I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited about that idea. Yeah, and I guess if you're an alien, I would, I would absolutely read it that way. If you're an alien xenobiologist, you study humans. But yes, I love that this game allows me to create a character that is a sentient cloud of traumatized mirrors that is also a lawyer. Uh, having chosen your traits, now create two beliefs. Yeah, maybe these are maybe these are situations in which your character gains bonus dice. Like if you're a pilot, piloting, driving, and navigation. Or like weapons, brawls, and athletics. I think may maybe that's that's sort of guidance around that stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, so we make our beliefs. Uh, their statement the character agrees with, the player wants to explore during play. That's a strong statement, right? Like, it's something, this really, the game really separates you from your character in the sense that you're thinking about things differently than your character would, right? It's... Um, author stance when you're making your character. So you you make a you pick a belief that the character agrees with but the player maybe doesn't and wants to uh wants to allow you to to figure that out as you play. 
So beliefs are the two most important ideas, questions, or themes that motivate your characters. By creating a belief, you're telling the GM you'd like to see it challenged during the game. Now, all this feels totally normal to me because of my experience with Burning Wheel, but I could see this being a challenge because it's the first big open question. Like, what does your character believe? And you're like, I was picking from a list before and now I'm intimidated. So that's, that's definitely a risk with a game like this. Um, but I think it's it's rewarding if you can get over that initial kind of uh, hump with your with your players. So when you enter into a conflict that directly confirms or refutes a belief, you might gain insight. you will be able to spend this to ask questions or pay the price of victory. If you accumulate enough insight, your character will make a final decision on a belief and upgrade it to an unchanging conviction. It's interesting because, again, remember, the fiction that gets modeled by the mechanisms of a role-playing game tell us what the world of that role-playing game is like. For example, Dungeons & Dragons has alignment, which is, in some editions, detectable by certain characters. So in the fiction of that world, morality is concrete. It is detectable by a neutral source. And you can look at somebody and say, you're evil. So in this game, uh, people may have beliefs. Insight allows them to understand their beliefs, but enough insight locks them into an unchanging conviction. I think it's very interesting because in my mind, and I'm not I'm not a sociologist or a psychologist, but I'm in my mind, the more insightful you become, the less likely you are to have unchanging convictions. Like, I feel like, I feel like uh, ideological stasis and insight are on opposite ends of a spectrum, not like close to one another, but, but maybe, maybe the, and, and again, not, not even maybe this game is specifically saying the more you learn about the world, the more insight you gain as you come in conflict uh, with other people uh, to confirm or refute your beliefs, you're gaining insight about your beliefs so that eventually they become they become static, right? They become like locked. Yeah, I'm curious about what it means to have convictions versus beliefs, right? So a good belief is a subjective, philosophical, and controversial statement. The conceit in After the War is that overwhelming evidence, here we go. The conceit in After the War is that the overwhelming evidence might be enough to convince someone to change their beliefs. Statements that are obviously true or false don't make for strong beliefs. Yeah, so... Beliefs may pertain to your origin, they may pertain to your war story, they may pertain to your profession. Use these guidelines as a starting point. Here are some, some sample beliefs. Anger is a gift. Infections must be exterminated. The union can return. I will say that for your very first character, most of these probably won't apply. Like, I guarantee, I guarantee if, if you're making a character and you've never played uh, After the War before, you're not gonna write a belief like Mars Corp knows best necessarily, or like the Union can return, because that requires some knowledge of the setting. I think second or third character, you start writing in like specific stuff like that, but violence is the best teacher, that you could do as a, as a start, right? So, uh, convictions. Some characters may have learned lessons from their journey to Palvo. You may have accepted or rejected a belief completely. The GM may allow you to create a character that starts a game with a conviction, which represents your firm stand on the issue. Convictions are written in the same way, but used differently. So, when you act in line with a conviction, you get an additional die. When you reflect upon a scene, you don't gain any insight from confronting your convictions. Your decision is final. Huh. All right. Your, your conviction cannot be changed through play, either through reason, dialogue, or mimetic corruption. During play, convictions can only be created during a moment of growth. So the game, oops. So the game wants us to be, uh, they want characters to have convictions, right? Because convictions, I mean, they, they lock and then they're stuck, right? You'll end up with two convictions and that's it, I guess. I mean, let's let's press on. Let's see. So come up with a name uh, and then a title or moniker for your character. Um, here's some common names. It's good. Useful. Uh, and then we make the second character, which is our settlement. So as a group, uh, we are going to collaborate on, uh, on building a uh, settlement. Now, normally you select one of the six core settlements, but you can also choose one of the three off-world settlements as well. Oh, I see. So the default assumption is you're playing in one of these, either Barley Mo, Warframe Yard, Fort Bly, Vermilion Exchange, Daedalus Station, or Port Thoth. 
or I guess in the advanced mode, you're playing on the Orc line, Longfall, or uh, Sargasso. And then there's details for all of those. Okay, well, so we'll take a look at them. And then select industries. Each settlement sustains itself through trade with their neighbors and specializes in certain industries. The industries represent the different types of work that define daily life in this community. Okay, so you pick three from the five potential that you're given. And then you answer questions for each settlement. Okay, so it's it's not about... It's not about uh, creating one from scratch like you would a gang in Blades. It's about picking a specific one and then tailoring it for your group. Okay. Um, each of the industries is represented by a non-player character known as a face. Right? And then the face has a name, a job, and a belief. Uh, and then you form relationships. Each player looks at the three faces and decides which one you have a close relationship with. Good. Okay. So it's tying you to the setting by way of NPCs. Uh, each settlement has key locations, the old bar where everyone knows your name, the remain of the warship, the longhouse, the agricultural workers. Each of the locations gives you context, and as a group, you create a location associated with those places. Okay. Well, let's, let's take a look then. Uh, each player arrives. Oh, this is the last step. Okay. Each player arrived at the settlement at different times. Um... Oh, you take on roles based on how or how the order you arrived. Interesting. Okay. So the person, the character who's lived in the settlement longest describes the community, what it looked like immediately after the war by answering these questions. The elder will welcome the character with the second most seniority on their arrival to the settlement. And get oh, so you, you figure out what order you arrived in. So you're like, I'm first, then uh, uh, Blue Jay is second, Dave is third, uh, Lauren is fourth and Elf arrived most recently. And since I got here first, I get to ask Blue Jay uh, a question about how they integrated into the community. And then that means that somebody else is the newcomer. Interesting. Okay. So the only, I guess the only thing that really matters is the first and last person that arrived. And then the GM will continue to, to ask. Uh, questions the newcomer the person who's arrived brings with them a new plot thread right a little hook for the for the game interesting okay all right cool so uh step eight is uh, a day in the life if you're planning on playing for multiple sessions take time to learn about the characters establish how the characters will act on a normal day okay so this is the beginning of the um this is the beginning of uh, apocalypse world right this is that kind of like if you're going to start a campaign do the slow burn, learn what the day in the life looks like, and then move on. But then here's another frame for one shot. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of glance through these uh, these sample communities. Obviously, you can you can take a closer look at the ones that are interesting to you if you grab the the PDF or grab a copy of the book. But I'm gonna take a quick look through them and kind of see what their what their vibe is. I would like to point out before we continue. Look at these adorable little bulls. Look at them. Or horned alien something or others. They're so cute. I love them. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you saw those. All right. So Barley Mo is a agricultural. Uh, it's an agricultural community, farming community. You pick exactly adorable Xeno beef. Uh, you pick farming, fishing, ranching, textiles, or logging, and then you assign. Each person, you draw a little, you could draw a little line on here or whatever. So it could be farming, and then the face for farming is Penitence the Shepherd. Uh, fishing, it's, or is these, are these just industries and faces like you have to? It's weird that Adiz the Fisher is on this list. I'm not totally certain if I'm supposed to pick and match them, or we just get... I think we just get the ones we get, right? Like if you if you tick farming, you get Pyotr. Okay. Got it. Yeah, Seraphina the Weaver too. Okay. All right. So it isn't for some reason I thought that it was going to be pick 3 pick 3 industries and then pick 5 uh, or pick 3 people, but it's not. It's fishing, this is the person. Textiles, that's the person. Okay. And then you answer some questions about your community. 
Uh, a boneyard settlement, the Warframe yard. It's got a big tree you can live in in the middle. It's like the Keebler elves. Yeah, right. Obviously, you can make your own. Uh, okay. All right. So vessels that fell from the sky onto the surface. This settlement was established in the midst of the rubble of fallen warships. That's way cooler than. Yeah, and that's right. There is only one column of of circles to to check. It's a good point. Um, yeah, boneyard settlement way cooler than a farming community. I don't know why. I I mean, I guess if you want to play like Space Dew Valley, you could pick Barley Mo, but. It's Warframe Yard. It looks so much cooler. Uh, military Outpost, Fort Bly. Uh, trading Post, the Vermilion Exchange. The art for these is great. That's true, the Xeno Beef. It's pretty good. And then Daedalus Station, uh, a research station. And then the Spaceport, Port Thoth. Or I think if you're like a real Egyptian nerd, it's Port Thoth. Anyway, Port Thoth, uh, and that's your that's your spaceport. And then these are these are some other options that you can make your own. And then obviously this is one of those like this is the place where uh, modular content can be added either by like Kickstarter extras or your own your own desires, right? So you could you could make up your own settlement with your own industries and your own people to represent them. Yeah, that wouldn't be too hard. And obviously we have a ton a ton of extra ideas. Uh, within the uh, within the game. Uh, cool. All right. So role playing games are all about choice. I I agree. I agree entirely. Uh, so role playing games are about choice. Uh, each of these choices tell us something about the characters. The rules in this chapter offer you structure to help you establish these choices and discover the consequences of your decisions. Okay. So before you learn about narrative structure or dice mechanics, we have to talk about how to create meaningful choices. Interesting. Okay. So this is some, this is some, um, it's not GM advice. It's like fundamental role playing stuff when it, as regards this game, which is pretty rare. You don't really usually see this stuff. So a complex choice means that there's no easy answer. You want the games to be, you want these basically they're, they're giving us advice on how to make choices complex compelling and consequential. So there's no easy answer that makes, that's part of what makes a choice good. Compelling means that the outcome success or failure matters to, to you as a character and a player. Consequential choice means that it, it'll have a lasting impact on the story. So these things are, these are good ways to think about in any role playing game. Like how do you make choices that are worth rolling for? How do you know when to engage choice uh, in the narrative? So I like this. I like this, this, Three C's, compelling, complex, consequential. Okay, got it. Um, the game rules structure the conversation. It divides the game into dramatic scenes and vulnerable moments. Scenes are the bulk of play. People work together to establish each scene. Moments are the interludes in between. And again, if you've played a lot of kind of structured storytelling games, uh, a lot of small press games use this kind of phased play to indicate what kinds of stories we're telling during what parts of the game, right? Mouse guard does the player turn and the GM turn torchbearer does the adventure phase and the town phase. Um, blades in the dark has the job and downtime. I'm sure you can think of lots more games that do this in a way unofficially dungeons and dragons kind of does this too. There's play and then there's like Paperwork, basically, there's that phase where you're like leveling up and doing tactical stuff as the as the player, right? So a lot of games use this kind of structured stuff either directly or indirectly. Yeah, right? Exactly. That's right, Trust. You roll initiative. That triggers combat and non-combat. Exactly. Yep. So uh the intent of this game. Wow, this is great that that Jason and, and uh Alistair are just fucking laying this out. Look, so the intent of After the War is to explore how beliefs shape our decisions and how they change. Here's how the rules work to encourage these behaviors. Each belief is subjective, contra subjective, controversial declaration. There's no objective right answer, which means you need to explore it during play. Uh, you frame scenes collaborati collaboratively. So each scene is established with a GM and two other players. Ah, so this takes a little bit of the pressure off of the GM to remember everybody's beliefs, right? The players can say, 
this is a scene that's going to establish conflict between our beliefs. And then you play through those scenes, trying to make each of the actor characters confront their belief, either supporting or refuting them. The first character is forced to determine if they really defend the merchant's greed over the well-being of the orphan. You roleplay collaboratively until a conflict is triggered. If you disagree on what happens next, you engage in the conflict rules. They revolve around your beliefs. Any player acting collects a die, plus one die for each trait, and a die for each conviction they're supporting. If the GM is involved, they roll threat plus vector dice instead. I guess we'll learn what those are. If a character is losing a conflict, they can suffer a point of strain to re-roll some or all of their dice. If they win a conflict, they suffer an additional point of strain. It's interesting that, that winning the conflict causes strain. Strain makes it more likely you'll fall in conflict, which can lead to the song or tormenta corrupting your beliefs. Interesting. Ah, here we go. At the end of the scene, the audience looks at the actor's beliefs. They determine if those beliefs have been supported or refuted, awarding a point of insight for each belief that's been confronted in either way. This is why we flip our character uh, cards around so you can tell who is the actor in the scene and who is acting as audience. Uh, trigger moments. If you get your third or sixth point of insight, you trigger a moment of discovery. It lets you ask questions about another character. More importantly, allows you to allows both yourself and the character to remove a point of strain. That way you recover and improve your chances to succeed. If you get your ninth point of instinct, you trigger a moment of growth, which transforms one of your beliefs into a conviction, which helps you in conflicts. It also creates a new replacement belief. Okay. So you want conflicts, or you want convictions because they help you in conflicts, and they also like free you up for new replacement beliefs. So... Like an experienced character in this game, I guess, would have a bunch of convictions and then two beliefs that they're testing. Hmm. Okay. So uh, we talked about this earlier. The three uh, the three aspects of a scene are platform, tilt, and question. So you create the initial situation. The tilt is the inciting uh, action that, that starts the scene, right? The person creating the tilt is responsible for creating problems, threats, and mysteries. Look to the platform for inspiration. So the G uh, here we go. The GM creates the platform, chooses another player. They make the tilt. After creating the tilt, that player chooses a third person to create the question. Right. And that's how you frame. That's how you frame scenes. Okay. All right. After establishing the scene, you decide how they wish to participate. They can be an actor or an audience member. If you're in actor mode, you're collaborating to create the story, you're role-playing your PC, you're getting the spotlight, participating in conflicts. If you're in audience mode, you're kind of a pseudo GM, role-playing NPCs, supporting the actors, adjudicating trait use, ending scenes, and awarding insight. Okay, so if you're an actor, you're playing your character, right? Getting into conflict, where we talked about setting goals. So, Okay. All right. So we, we, we frame up a scene, we assign actor or, or audience role. We start to play. Um, the narration gets to a point where conflict is triggered. Both people in the conflict declare what they want to happen, right? If I, at the end of this conflict, uh, you will, you will go to the mayor's office and you will hand in your resignation if I win. And they're like, if I win, uh, you will join project Prometheus and you'll never question my authority as leader again. Uh, okay, you have a chance to back down or negotiate a compromise. Otherwise, you know what the stakes are, and then we get the dice in. Uh, most GM goals support either the song or Tormenta. Only rarely the GM will trigger a goal outside that context. Hmm, okay. So it's mostly like PvP, right? In that sense, because you're, you're butting heads with somebody else, and you're both trying to get your goals challenged. So during conflict, you start with a single die. You add one for each trait that could help you achieve your goal. You could have a maximum of plus six. Uh, you add additional die for each conviction you support or confirm with your action. So if you have a conviction that's like, I no authority can go unquestioned, you could add another die because now you're telling this other player like, no, I don't think you're the one that should run Project Prometheus. Someone else should do it. You're a madman. Uh, refuting your convictions or addressing your beliefs will not affect your dice pools. Okay, all right. And then 
the vector. Oh, here's the the GM one. So the GM will choose to either portray the seductive influence of the song or the violent passions of Tormenta. Sounds like the name of a weird wrestler from the 80s. The strength of the opposition varies depending on how they're conflicting the players. Right. So vector is how much mimetic influence is behind the conflict and threat is the number of people who are in danger. Right. And we'll learn about that on 161. Interesting. So it's like how strong is the is the conflict in terms of mimetic influence and how many people are in trouble? Okay. Roll the dice, count up your total. Whoever has the greatest total wins. You ignore any dice with the results equal to or less than your strain. Oh, interesting. So if you have three strain, only four, five, and six on D6s count. If you're losing a conflict, you can take a point of strain and reroll, or anyone offering you concrete assistance can take that hit for you. In the case of a tie, you can take two strain as the price of victory. In a conflict between two players, the first player to claim it will win. If no one claims victory in a two-player conflict, the GM describes an external event that interrupts the conflict. Oh, that's nice. I kind of like that. Like, the idea that that if there's a tie, then something interrupts. Like, you can't finish this argument because the power plant overloads, and now you're both going to have to put aside your argument about Project Prometheus and go deal with that shit instead. That's clever. I like that. That's a nice way to break a tie, because they probably won't come up that often because the roles are pretty granular. Um, but when they do, it means something interrupts you and you're like, we're going to put this aside and come back to it later. That might be my favorite mechanism so far. Tiebreaker is saved by the bell. Yeah. If no one will claim it. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. That's clever. Uh, both sides of the conflict work together to narrate how the victor achieves their goals. There's always a price associated and the victor is the one who pays it. Um, if a player wins a conflict, they gain a point of strain to represent the price of victory. I'm not really sure narratively what that looks like, like why you take strain when you win. But maybe maybe that'll become more clear as we as we look at the reward structure in the game. So uh, scene audience. So if you're in the audience instead of playing, you're considered an audience member. Uh, you play side characters when needed. Um, you can describe elements of the setting. This game almost doesn't sound like it needs a GM. Like it's, it's not even a GM. It feels like you have player character, player character, player character, meme player, right? Where it's like my job is to portray mostly the song and Tormenta, but I'm still like, I have a role. It feels more like, um, archipelago necessarily than it does, uh, apocalypse world in that way uh, because the audience takes on so much of that stuff like the heat bears down on you uh something something reminds you of your past like i i kind of love that idea of audience members being able to jump in and take up some of that slack for the for the uh, the gm i like the structuring that's quite cool um each trait has a series of three situations would apply, but also has room to grow. During play, actors have the opportunity to expand these traits by establishing a fourth situation where it would apply. As the audience, you judge if it makes sense for the relevant trait. Lucio wants to use Tora's belt or origin for a die in a bar fight. Since brawling isn't on the list, one of the audience members asks Tora how they used this in the past. Tora's player describes the food riots of their youth. Right, okay, any other new belters add this situation, and then that's it, right? So that's where these three, you, we were right about how it was like, if you're a belter, you probably get dice when it relates to salvage, scarcity, and disputes, but anybody who is a belter can then pitch for brawling. Right, okay. Uh, and then as a judge, right, you as a group get to decide whether or not beliefs are being confronted or, or established or whatever. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. Okay. So once the actors have found the answer to the scene's question, you're welcome to close the scene. This feels to me, can we just talk about this for a second? So if we zoom in to the scene level, it feels to me like the scene uh, stuff from Microscope, right? Once you've answered the scene's question, because doesn't Microscope say when you do a scene, you frame something you want to answer when you do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It totally feels like that. 
You aren't forced to end the scene immediately, but look for a good opportunity to wrap it up. After the scene fades to black, examine each character's insight track. If their track has reached one of the milestones to trigger a moment of discovery or growth, play through that now. If they choose to delay the moment, cease to mark further insight till they do. Right, so it's it's a track around this triangle, right? One, two, three, discovery. Four, five, six, discovery. Seven, eight, nine, growth. If you decide to continue playing the game, move on a frame in the next scene. Take a minute to get snacks or refreshments. Right, okay. So those are scenes, and then when we're done those, we do moments, periods of introspection, discussion, and radical vulnerability. Four different kinds of moments with different triggers and impacts. So a moment of discovery is triggered by the insight, right? So you have your moment of discovery. Uh, another player uh, asks you about, or you ask another player about their character's thoughts, history, or relationships. They're obliged to answer your question, either by role-playing or narrating events. Consider using flashbacks and narrative techniques. Discovery deepens bonds and adds nuance to the story. It removes strain from each person involved. It's the only way to remove strain during a session. Interesting. So it's a way, when you have a moment of discovery about your own beliefs, you then ask other people about their characters. That's your reward for getting to know yourself better. Okay. A moment of growth is when you decide to accept or reject one of your beliefs. So when you reach the growth milestone, right? A uh, moment of growth is a deeply personal, meaningful conversation between characters. It's an opportunity to explore your decision. The other player will help you resolve your belief. After you play through the scene, your belief will be transformed into a conviction. If you accept it, copy it onto the conviction. If you rejected it, write a new conviction to describe your new view of the world. Interesting. Okay. All right. So... When you finish writing the conviction, erase the old belief. Unlike a moment of discovery, you don't you don't remove strain and then reset your insight track. Okay. So it doesn't have to be Polvo is our only home and that becomes your conviction. Instead, it could be Polvo is our only home. We struggle with it and instead we find technology is a drug. We find something else. Okay. Um... A moment of corruption. This is this is a moment where the ah here we go. The player who lost the conflict uh, achieves their goal, narrates the outcome, and pays the price of victory as if they had won normally. Then pass their character to the sheet to the GM, who gets to alter one of their beliefs. Interesting. So whenever the game master wins a conflict, they can cede victory, and then mess with someone's belief instead. If the GM had been representing the song, they'll alter a belief to align with the ideals of conformity, servitude, and evangelism. If you'd been representing Tormenta, alter the beliefs to align with rebellion, dominance, and violence. That's cool. And that's kind of scary in the sense that, like, this is a game in which you're not in control of your own character. Not exclusively. Like, if you... And it's, I mean, it's a game about mimetic violence, right? So, of course not. This idea that if you come in conflict with the song, you might find that you are changing in a way that you don't want. Yeah, that's that's cool. Yeah, this is a game where you're not your character. Definitely. I would say this game is very much written in a uh, predominantly author stance. Yeah, we're talking about our characters rather than as them a lot of the time. Well, the GM can replace the belief. The best GMs will twist the meaning subtly by changing one or two words. That's awesome. This is very cool. I like it. The character is not consciously aware their belief was corrupted and will rationalize any change in perspective. Corruptions are horrific and brutal violation of character identity. They are the horrific elements that destabilize Polvo. That is so cool. It's the tension of a zombie movie, right? It's like, wait a second, you got bit, but it happens in your mind, so you'll never know, and the characters never know, you're acting different. That's like a, that's that starts a witch hunt. Like, have you noticed, have you noticed that Dan's been acting funny lately? Instant paranoia, right? Instant fear, instant like, wait, how? How has Dan been acting differently, right? Like, yeah, you know, he used to he used to be like quiet and keep his opinions to himself. And now he won't shut up. He's just telling everybody what he thinks all the time. Has Dan just changed as a person or has Dan been infected by the song? Scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I like that. And this, oh my god, so since you're doing this as a group, this moment of corruption thing 
is a perfect example of when to use the X card, right? So like, here's an example. So I'm going to read this because I think it's, it's a nice clarification. While Caria was trying to keep a group of chorister cultists from entering the, entering the settlement, she lost a key conflict. The GM agreed and triggered a moment of corruption. While Caria narrated repelling the polite cultists, a soft melody crept into her mind. Caria held the belief that liberty protects, I, I assume this is supposed to say, liberty protects the vulnerable. Um, so liberty protects the vulnerable. The GM originally proposed changing it to slavery protects the vulnerable, but Caria's player was very uncomfortable with it and vetoed the change. You can just X card the thing. You can be like, nope, we don't. That's I don't like that idea. The GM proposed liberty makes us vulnerable, which Caria's player is much happier with. Caria returns to the settlement, and speaks the next town hall. She argues loudly a curfew is necessary because of the chorister threat. She isn't even aware she's serving the malevolent force with every word. Yeah, the entire group and audience knows that it's happening. So it's not actually like PVP, like angry fuckery. We come to the table knowing that we're not necessarily in control of our own characters. I like that. That's that's quite cool. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, when a main character fills the sixth strain on the character sheet, it's a sign someone will leave the story. By default, it means that someone will be retired from play. Normally means your character dies, disappears, or is permanently incapacitated. If your character has a strong relationship with an NPC, you can decide they are sacrificed instead. This is a narrative decision, meaning it's the player's choosing, not the character. Oh, that's awesome. So do you want your character to live or do you want to off an NPC close to you? You have ablative relationships at the player level. The character isn't actively choosing to sacrifice their friends, but you as a player are like, you know, it's more interesting if they survive and a really bad thing happens to someone close to me. Yeah, it's like Berg. Exactly. So grief occurs after the tragic scene concludes where the main character reacts to the loss by answering one of the following questions about the fallen character. Oh, so sad. What did I never get to say to them? What will I never forgive you for doing? Why do you blame yourself for the loss of the fallen? Each player asks, and so you get a little funeral. And then each character, after all questions have been shared, each character clears all the strain they've accumulated. So if there's a moment of grief, if so, of grief, if somebody hits six strain, we all recover our strain after we lose them. Yeah, that's that's very cool. Cool. All right. So you can play it either as a one shot, a short campaign or a long campaign. There are structured rules for those things. The game has uh, an agenda and responsibilities for the GM and some tools for running the game. Right. So your agenda is to remember home, bring the fallout, challenge their beliefs, speak honestly pretty good that's a pretty good agenda right remember that everyone here came from somewhere else show that we are still dealing with the fallout of a war this is the game loop right what will you what do you believe what will you fight to protect this game would be a fun i think it'd be a fun one shot i'd like to give this a try it's a cool different kind of sci-fi speak honestly it wouldn't be too hard to reframe this game to make it set in acheron row Right, like right after the war with the Blood Eagle, right after the war with the STO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The GM's responsibility. So what do you do as the GM? Uh, administer logistics. I like this. So it's clearly saying this is what the game, this is what you as the GM must do. These are these are parts of your job. You should schedule and coordinate running the game. Normally that's assumed the GM will do that. It's nice that it's like this is what you're going to do, right? Schedule it. You're going to make sure everybody has the material they need to play the game. You're going to make sure that uh, you schedule a break and that people have water and like you're actually going to take care of your players. That's part of your job as the GM. That is your responsibility. Uh, oh, I like this. This is nice. And I, I actually I actually have seen this. Somebody somebody quoted this somewhere else. Um, and I've, I've seen a bit of this before, but. The game master holds a special authority at the table and you need to use it for good. There's a great deal of difficult content associated with this game. It's a game about survivors and the trauma they suffered during a vast military conflict. It focuses on the stories of refugees who left their homes and loved ones behind. Look out for the physical, mental, and emotional well-being of your players. Keep the X card available so that people can opt out of problematic subject matter. 
Uh, if someone is uncomfortable or appears to be stressed at the table, offer them space to recover or take a break to discuss it in private. Like it, it basically puts this on the GM to say like, take care of this stuff, right? Now, just like any game, you can hack the rules, right? You can say, I don't, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to do these things or I can't, right? I can't take care of, uh, scheduling, right? Maybe that's something else you can, you can hack the game and give that authority to another player, but it's nice that it just lays out like by default, the GM should be thinking about taking care of the players in the sense that they're comfortable and that it's a pleasant space to play in and that everybody feels safe because the GM does have a special authority and it's nice that the game is encouraging you to do that, right? Uh, it's your job to establish scenes, direct the spotlight, maintain continuity. That's not my job. That's chat's job. Chat, you do that. I'm delegating that to you. And offer opposition, right? And then to do opposition, to, 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 fulfill, to fulfill this job, right? To offer opposition, you use threat dice, right? So every conflict threatens someone or something. You gain a number of threat dice for the pool based on the greatest danger. If the greatest danger is to physical property or social standing, you only get one. But if the whole settlement is in immediate danger, you get five. Your vector dice, right? Uh, your vector dice get added. And I guess as a GM, you'd want three different colors. I'd have like red dice for Tormenta, blue dice for the song, and then like black dice for threat. Um... So vector dice is how much influence do these things have on the situation, right? A mimetic force is embodied and acting directly. That gives you stage five mimetic infection, right? So you have five dice. But if there's no clear sign, uh, no clear sign, you always get one. And you can't trigger a moment of, uh, of, of um, corruption here. So the more people are at risk and the more force there is behind that risk. Cool. So here are here are antagonists, right? So the antagonists in this game, the the factions, the song. The song is not the individual. The song is not freedom of will. The song is not complete. The song is what caused the war, uh, what alienated humanity, what led directly to the havoc unleashed on dirt, but it didn't die. It can't die. There's a small choir on dirt. They meet in secret beneath one of the settlements. So this this idea, this little bit is reminding me of demons in Dogs in the Vineyard, right? Like that paranoia of like who's who's a devil worshiper, who's a member of the choir in this case. Right? And then this is this is how everyone who's vulnerable to the song is at stage one, and then this walks you through like echoes of the song, singers of the song, ensembles and symphonies, right? So these are different manifestations of the song. And then Tormenta, this is our nanotech virus to destroy the song that we created. Uh, Jesus. Yeah, and it makes... What are those guys called in Firefly? Re Reavers? Deadites? Chaos, wor chaos worshippers? Right? Yeah. If the song is uh, Zinch, then Tormenta is corn. Right. And so this is what happens. You eventually become horrors. And I, I really like I like the idea. I really like the idea that the earliest signs of Tormenta are kind of secret. Like you're angry all the time or you're like highly passionate or rebellious. People would be like that. Jimmy, he's a he's a rebellious boy. Never goes to church. He shirks his duties. I wonder best keep an eye on that boy right like this you could still just be a regular human if you're if you're two or three and i guess that's the idea right is like is it a thought virus maybe they're born with it maybe it's tormenta yeah until eventually yeah you assemble in packs and you become horrific non-humans yeah yeah that's interesting uh, and then there are four major political factions that are meddling, but the GM will pick two and we don't care about the uh, the other. So uh, the free companies, uh, which are uh, like mercenary groups, the peacekeepers, uh, volunteer permancers and later humans, 
uh, who are uh, trying to get rid of the mimetic infection uh, on Polvo. And then uh, Black Sky Industries, right? They invented uh, Tormenta to save us. And the Galactic Union Defense Fleet. Uh, we've also got Mars Corp. So you would pick, I guess, from these groups, right? Free Company, Peacekeeper, Black Sky. Wait, there's five. I'm confused. Four major political factions. The Free Companies, Peacekeepers, Black Sky, Galactic Union Defense. I guess there's five. All right. Uh, so as game master, this is your this is your your job. This is how you you cr you track the game's ongoing stuff, right? It's the plot map that lets you fulfill the uh, roles of uh, of game master. So let's see how it works. You've got settlements. You've got face characters, and you've got player characters. Okay. And then down here, we have history threads and relationship threads. All right. So the player character settlement is not isolated. It's one of six. You keep track of the five nearby. Ah, uh, okay. So whatever you whatever you pick, the other ones still exist. They're still around. Okay, all right. Um, your home settlement is loyal to the player characters, generally works towards your benefit. Uh, no matter the conflicts, you're part of that community. You'll discover the neighboring communities are loyal to something else. You mark loyalties as you discover them. Each settlement might be, ah, I see, loyal to the song, loyal to Tormenta, loyal to the free companies, loyal to Peacekeeper, Black Sky, Fleet, or Mars Corp. This is kind of like tracking influence, right? Where it's like, okay, uh, the Warframe Yard is, uh, is player character oriented, but... Fort Bly is loyal to the peacekeepers. And then as uh, as places get corrupted or as they get influenced, you you mark uh, what their influence is. Right. OK. The players communities are represented through a series of non-player characters and as the faces we established three of them. You can create more anytime. Um, during settlement, you pick your three. As a GM, you use the face to portray the mood, personality, opinions of the community. Right. So they are stand ins. These characters have history with other settlements and form relationships as well. Everything revolves around the important figures. This is a PC centric game. And then we start to draw. Yeah. The little symbols tie history threads on the plot map. They're actually not alien symbols. They're just weird alphabet. Uh, if we look, we can see it's a B C D E F G H. They're just, uh, the text is just presented in a, some of them are sideways and some of them are standing up. Uh, okay, cool. So how do those work? We draw history threads. Here we go. History threads at the bottom of the map represent the interaction between a face character and a neighboring settlement. You create a single history thread during character settlement creation and then an additional history at the beginning of each session. You would mark history by drawing a line from a settlement to the face character. When you have that link, summarize it down at the bottom. Uh, okay. All right. So that's, yeah, got it. That's, so we know Talus is connected to Barley Mo. Talus is in a trade war with Barley Mo, and now there's a grain shortage. Right. And we would know what face Talus is and what industry we're dealing with Barley Mo. Okay. Right. So you do that at the beginning of each session based on what you know about the world. Right. And then this is just kind of the flow of the flow of pre of, uh, of play. Okay, cool. So some setting material, right? These are things that the, the, the game, the game started, uh, the game started in 2020. This was its, its history. And then this is sort of the history of humanity and the war and what happened. So if you pick when you're making your character's backstory, if you chose dissonance, you can find some information about dissonance here. It's basically just broadening what we already know, right? Some more setting material about Earth, about Mars. I like that it I like that it comes so much after character creation. Like cuz this all now feels comfortably optional. I feel like if I never read any of this stuff and I just 
did character creation, I would still be adequately prepared to play the game. And then I could use this to get in there and, and figure out more, uh, figure out more detail. Right. Okay. Pointy horse. Bear with a slightly too human face. It's gonna. Hello there. <laughs> I think this bear comes from the same planet as Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, yeah. Okay. So they are, uh, four of uh, the, the little four units of it's the bear council. Yep. Okay. Uh, and then the Fundar and Rasgado. Um, the Alluvia. I don't know why there's a picture of a human in this, this picture of an Alluvia. Sparkle wankers. <laughs> I like that. That's nice. <laughs> Good. Uh, cool. All right. So that's the Olivia and then the Mercurio. The Galactic Union. This is all setting material. It's interesting, but it's not. I flip through this stuff. Stargates. Like clearly, clearly some, some, uh, Cowboy Bebop Stargate inspiration here. Very cool. Um, learning about different planets, sanctuary worlds. And then this is what we know about uh, Polvo, the home uh, planet where we've all come to create a new, uh, a new world. Interesting. So there's like a whole, this is great. There's a whole kind of mid game uh, page about, this was Alex Roberts. Where that one? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think a lot of the art is is like real people. I think I saw a picture of Kira uh, in here as well. So let me. I'm gonna read this page. This is interesting. Colonization narratives end badly for everyone. For the colonized in particular, there's a long history of science fiction glorifying the conquest of the stars, and the last thing we want to do is perpetuate the horrors of imperial conquest. Here's how after the war addresses the topic. The Union has visited dozens of garden worlds with team which team with life and inevitably have multiple indigenous people living within them. Only three of the garden worlds lack a native population and Polvo was one of their number. The Permancer Guardians are zealous protectors of these native peoples and prevent any contact by other spacefaring people. Even the existence of these trusty worlds have been withheld from humanity based on their terrible track record. The Permancers wouldn't have sanctioned colonization of someone else's world, even to the Exodus fleet. The only reason why the Permancer allowed humans to settle on Polvo was due to the absence of indigenous sentience. After the war is intended to address issues of community, found family, and trauma, it's not designed to address issues of colonialism critically, but there are several games that do that. We recommend you pick up, pick up Dog Eat Dog or The Deep Forest. We also recommend reading the excellent article by Oren uh, Ashkenazi titled Five Destructive Myths Perpetuated by Role-Playing Games. That is pretty cool. Uh, it's cool that they at least like address it where they're like, this is a thing that sci-fi does. We actively are avoiding doing that. This is not a game about that. Also, because we're not a game about decolonization or addressing colonialism critically, here are some things that are that go and check them out. That's very cool. It's nice. It's nice that it's saying like this game is not for those things, but it doesn't mean those things aren't valuable. Check out other games that have done that work. Uh, I can personally vouch for Dog Eat Dog. It's a great game. Yeah, it's very cool. I like that that just pops up in the middle there where they're just like, let's talk about colonialism and sci-fi. Very cool. You get some nice details about muck hoppers and bone eels. Ugh. Oh no, the Kappa is a large-eyed insectivore that is discovered in settlements that are safe places to nest in. Colonies form within the perimeter and they spend their evenings snapping up hummers with their face tentacles. Human colonists are attempting to domesticate the Kappa for pest removal and keep them as pets, much to the Kappa's confusion. You can't, you can't domesticate the Kappa. The Kappa is an unstoppable negative force. It cannot be stopped. Also cute, uh, cute Dune reference. Muad worms. Get it? It's Muadib. Yep. Great. <laughs> I get it. A lot of big crabs, scary monsters that live on this planet. 
some invasive animals. And then our sort of big picture, if you want stuff. Oh, Rivendale. This is my favorite. <laughs> it's my favorite show. It's a CW show. It's about uh, teenage drama, but everybody's an elf. Yeah. Yeah, Rivendale. You should check it out. It's good. How the planet works. Economics of the universe. And then we have our examples of play. Right. Sick. And then some NPCs. Settlement creation walkthrough. It's got like a full replay. That's nice. Oh, that's cool. And it's got iconography for all the roles. Oh, this is cool too. This little like bit at the end. So costly victory, this subsection here at the end of this conflict talks about like how else could this have been handled? Like what other ways, what other ways would this, would this have gone? And what would that look like mechanically, right? Alternate universe versions. That's cool. And then it comes a little, little adventure. So, and, and nice. I, I would expect this at this point from this game. This adventure deals with child abuse and community trauma. Be open with your players about this and establish boundaries with regards on how explicitly you'll be showing violence against children and other vulnerable parties. Please refer to the safety tools and approach with care. I, honestly, every, I feel like every adventure, every module should just come with like a little paragraph. Like here's some stuff that's in this adventure. You might want to talk about it with your players first. It's not a spoiler. It's a way to not have a miserable time. Because I know, I know if I were playing a sci-fi game and my GM didn't tell me most of this adventure takes place in an abandoned hospital and most of the scary stuff in the game is going to be like people getting medical procedures done to them or like evil doctor shit, I would immediately be like, huh. so can we, I, I, I'm not going to be able to do that. I can't, I won't be able to engage with that content. And if I was told that in advance, there might be a way to like salvage the game. But if it happened right in the middle and they were like, yeah, you set foot on the, the doomed medical frigate and then your own ship blows up and now you can't escape, get ready for all the horror. I'd be like, great. And now I feel terrible. <laughs> so it's, it's cool that this little content note is at the beginning of the, of the module. It's, it's tools for creating a safe environment. And it really, we really should see this at the beginning of kind of any any module, any any pre-built stuff, including games, right? Like I like I like games. I'd love to see Dungeons and Dragons have a page that says like, "Hi, welcome to Dungeons and Dragons. We know you're super excited. D&D is a game about Here are some things that are in D&D by default. I mean, we talked about this when we looked at Pathfinder, right? Baseline. Baseline. What to expect from the game? What are you going to get out of it if you play it as written? What do you think you might want to change because this stuff is in the game? Here are the things that are easy to remove. Here are the things that are deep in the mechanisms and you'll never be able to get them out of the game. Do with it what you will, right? I think, and I like, obviously this is one of those things that people will say, why do any games need this? It's a role-playing game. You should be talking to your players anyway. The GM should read the whole thing. But like games exist to provide a framework so give us a framework for having that safety conversation. This is great. I'm, I'm happy about this. It's like the game is self-aware. It still gets to do and say what it wants to do and say, but it warns us what that might look like and provides us with tools and links there too to navigate those more safely. So that's cool. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to read this whole adventure for you because you might want to use it or play it. And then this is the chapter for... Optional stuff if you want to get weird, including space magic, off-world settlements, and a hacker's guide for managing your own creations within the game. That's very cool. Cybernetics, mystic arts, psionics, songcraft. Ooh, those who join the choir receive mighty blessings. Oh God, I wonder if it was like this, you would end up with a character who's like, I'm going to get just a little bit infected, like just a little, I can, I can fight it. I promise I'm going to get just a little bit infected so that I can use the song's power against itself. Right. That's, that's some, some Boromir type shit right there. Yep. 
moments of corruption, getting mutated, precursor artifacts. Yeah, cool. And then some potential truths about the precursors. Nice. Cool. And so at this point, we get a hacker's guide. So how to change the game to better suit our needs. And then it explains to us how to do that based on a bunch of different protocols, right? Like, do we want to adjust the game? Do we want to reskin the game? Do we want to take the mechanics and use it in another game? Here's how. Oh, that's so cool. Right. So this is this is what I learned as the designer. This is what we learned as the designer of the game. And how you can break it for your own purposes. So cool. There you go. Pretty cool. So my my kind of like thoughts, my thoughts about this game after flipping through it is that it feels to me, it feels to me very much like a um a product of uh, of the forge. Uh, it feels like a very well done, like highly polished game that would come out of that space. Uh, the the structured uh, like scene framing, the aggressive author stance of the game, right? The clear, like you are playing this game to tell a story, not to embody and immerse yourself in a character. Uh, it feels to me, yeah, like it, it, it's produced using the same sort of school of thought that gave us Microscope or uh, Fall of Magic or like older stuff like Troll Babe or Sorcerer, right? It feels like it's a part of that that school. And it's honestly, it's kind of nice to play a game that's not a Powered by the Apocalypse game or a Forged in the Dark game or a 5e game, right? It's nice to see games that are clearly inspired by other work, but not just straight up like built on those frameworks. Um, I saw some folks in chat talking about other games that it, it kind of reminds them of. And I, I love that. I love seeing those threads within a game. And you know me, I like a game that does one thing and does that one thing quite well. And reading through this, I can already think of some people that I think would be fun to, to play a game like this with. So if you're interested in checking out a game that is a uh, sci-fi mimetic horror game about communities and about uh, being a refugee and about trying to build and protect something uh, after a, a terrible conflict, uh, this this game after the war might be something uh, that you are uh, you are interested in. So go and check it out. Uh, you can do that. Uh, you can do that by if you're in uh, Twitch right now. Uh, there is a command uh, after the war. We'll give you a link to go check it out. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, go to bitly slash after the war fl uh, and uh, give it a look. It's available as a PDF uh, and in print. And I believe if you get the print version, you get the PDF for free. Um, go, go and, and, and check it out. Uh, and while you're there, uh, I think, let me see, uh, let's see here. Let's see what else you can get. I mean, I just want to walk through like, cause there's some downloads, I think. So, uh, yeah, grab the, grab the download pack, get the character sheets. There are, we didn't look at them, but there are unique sheets for each of these, uh, each of the things that we looked at, right? There's a GM sheet, a character sheet. Uh, there are, um, uh, there are sheets for managing the GM's stuff that we looked at. Um, so go and go and give it a look and uh, let me know what you think. Check it out. Give it a play. Um, Spark is a super cool game. Uh, Sig Manual of the Plains also super cool. So it's nice to see, yeah, this kind of survival horror expanse thing. Yeah, I'm into it. Uh, thank you to Genesis of Legend for uh, for giving me the opportunity to do this. Uh, the sponsored first look, uh, Jason, thanks for giving me your game and for trusting me to take a look at it. It's super cool. Thanks for sharing it with us and uh, audience. Thanks for coming. Uh, we have uh, we have another first look. I've got quite a few of them. We have another first look coming up. I think as soon as I'm back from vacation, uh, the next first look will be on the 17th of December, December 17th. We're going to be taking a look at a game called Goblinville. So uh, I think uh, I think if we if it'll be nice, it'll be a nice contrast. Intense, serious, social sci-fi, Goblinville. So we'll do Goblinville, and then a lot of people have been asking me if I'm going to be doing a first look at Lancer. 
uh, which is the uh, the new mech RPG by the uh, creator of Kill Six Billion Demons? The answer is yes. Uh, we'll do that at the end of December or uh, early in uh, in January. Uh, I'll definitely be giving that a look as well. So Goblinville, Lancer, both coming up in the uh, in the near future. Uh, I'll let you know. Just keep an eye on Twitter for when those are going to happen. Thank you again for coming, everybody. We will see you next time uh, for more RPG first looks. That's it for me. Bye. Go roll some dice.